Okay, everybody, next uh, chapters that we're going to look at uh, in this session are chapters 28 and chapter 29 of 1 Samuel. And um, because of time <coughs> restrictions in our lecture, <coughs> excuse me, we're not going to read the chapters. I'm going to summarize them for you. But for those of you who are listening online, I strongly suggest you pause the recording right now and you read chapter 28 and 29 and also 30 and 31. In other words, you ride, read right the way through to the end of 1 Samuel. So when you've done that, then you can switch back on the recording. We're going to pray together and then we're going to, to look at this stuff. Father, I thank you for every um, man and woman here. And Lord, I pray that with thoughts full of going home and packing and all the rest of it, Father, I pray that by your Spirit you'd help us to focus now and to hear what you're saying to us. I ask, Father, for your help uh, that I will be clear and concise in the things that I say. And I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Okay, so what I wanted to do by way of uh, just beginning this lecture, the title, I don't know if it interests you or not, uh, it probably will by the time we get to the end of this, is why does God seem to help one person and not another person? And what we're going to do in a few moments is to compare what God is doing in David's life with what God is doing at the same time in Saul's life. And ask why the Lord seems to deal with David very, very differently than he does with Saul. And the question then comes, so how is God going to be dealing with me in the uh, months and years ahead in my life? So let me just give you an overview of the final four chapters in 1 Samuel. And you might want to have your Bible open and just kind of be glancing down the chapters as I describe them. So 1 Samuel chapter 28 uh, is all about the Philistines preparing to invade Israel with David. And the forces are gathering together on the borders of Israel. And then the rest of that chapter is all about Saul consulting, in some Bibles she's called the Witch of Endor, in other Bibles called the Medium at Endor. And the key verse, I would suggest, verses that we're going to read, are verses 16 through 19. This is uh, Samuel, who's been called up by the medium, and uh, Samuel is addressing Saul. Samuel said, Why do you consult me now that the Lord has turned away from you and become your enemy? The Lord has done what he predicted through me. The Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hands and given it to one of your neighbours, to David. Because you didn't obey the Lord or carry out his fierce wrath against the Amalekites, the Lord has done this to you today. The Lord will hand over both Israel and you to the Philistines, and tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. The Lord will also hand over the army of Israel to the Philistines. So that's chapter 28. Chapter 29, Achish, who's the king of Gath, and remember that a king in, of a city in those days, we would probably today refer to as a mayor. A king wasn't somebody who controlled the entire country. A king was somebody who controlled just that city. Achish, the king of Gath, is ordered by the joint chiefs of staff to throw David out of the invading forces. The Philistine forces that are going into Israel and David was going to be marching with them and it was going to be so difficult and embarrassing for him. Uh, God deals with that by getting David ordered back. And the key verse there, chapter 29, verse 11. So David and his men got up early in the morning to go back to the land of the Philistines and the Philistines went up to Jezreel to engage in battle with Saul and his army. And then chapter 30, David returns to the city 
in the land of the Philistines that's been given to him, the city of Ziklag, and he finds that while the cat's been away, the mice have been playing. While he and his armed men have been gathering with the Philistine forces to march into Israel, some of the enemies of David, some of the groups of people he's been attacking and lying about it, some of their allies have now attacked the city of Ziklag. They've destroyed it with fire, burned it to the ground. They've carried off uh, captive all the women, all the children, all, all the stuff's just been, just been taken away. And David inquires of the Lord and chases and finds the invading forces, the ones who've attacked Ziklag. 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 7. Then David said to Abiathar the priest, the son of Ahimelech, bring me the ephod. You remember what the ephod was? The ephod was one of the ways that in those days they asked God direct questions. And we suggested inside of it were the urim and the thummim. Some people suggest two stones, black on one side, white on the other, and they would throw them out before the Lord. And if it was two whites, that was a yes. Two blacks were a no. Black and a white was God didn't answer. Bring me the ephod. Abiathar brought it to him. And David inquired of the Lord, Shall I pursue this raiding party? Will I overtake them? I mean, just imagine if this was you. You go home next week and your home doesn't exist. And your town doesn't exist. It's been burnt to the ground. And nobody knows what's happened. I mean, how would you know which direction to go to try and locate the people who've done that? This is what David is asking of the Lord. Will I overtake them? Pursue them, the Lord answered. You will certainly overtake them and succeed in the rescue. And then the final chapter of 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 31, describes the death of Saul and his sons and the victory of the Philistines over the whole of Israel. The end of 1 Samuel is just so depressing for Israel. And I would suggest the key verses there verses 6 through 8. So Saul and his three sons and his armor bearer and all his men died together that same day. When the Israelites along the valley and those across the Jordan saw that the Israelite army, Israelite army had fled and that Saul and his sons had died, they abandoned their towns and fled. And the Philistines came and occupied them. The next day, when the Philistines came to strip the dead, they found Saul and his three sons fallen on Mount Gilboa. All right, lightning survey of those final four chapters. And honestly, you would get far more from what we're looking at if you read those chapters rather than just had a summary uh, in your mind. So what I thought we would do to begin with is to get an interesting but not a central question out of the way. And that has to do with Saul and the witch of Endor. Uh, this is where God isn't answering Saul in any way at all. Uh, there's no prophet to talk to. Samuel is dead. Nobody's got a word from the Lord for Saul. He's freaking out. And so he goes to talk to this medium. And the obvious question is, whom did the medium bring up from the dead? It says in the text, it's Samuel. Now, there are actually only three options that I know of because we immediately struggle with, well, well you know, why, how could a medium bring up from the dead Samuel to answer Saul's questions? Uh, and and it's, it's an obvious dilemma. Well, the first answer that scholars give is this was an evil spirit that was masquerading as Samuel. Um, I, I think we often answer an evil spirit or Satan when we don't know the answer to a question. Just check that up sometimes. So uh, if somebody who claims to be a medium today gives somebody information that helps them in the future, we say, oh, well, that was Satan. Now, I understand why we say that, but mm, I'm, I'm not so sure that, that um, Satan would have sent an evil spirit to masquerade as Samuel. If, if that answer satisfies you, great. Um, other scholars say, no, 
this was the real Samuel. Because the message that Samuel brings to David, uh, beg your pardon, to Saul, is exactly what God has been saying to Saul. You're finished. Your history. You have been disobeying me so long, I have nothing more to say to you via Samuel than what Samuel said to you when you were alive. The, the kingdom is being taken from you and handed to someone else that I've chosen. So, could be the real Samuel, or a slight variant on that, it could be the real Samuel whom the Lord, not the medium, brought up. It's interesting that when Samuel appears, the medium is absolutely terrified and immediately recognises the person who's asking the questions is King Saul. She hasn't realised that because Saul has disguised himself. But when the real Samuel appears, it's as though truth shines into the heart of the medium and she recognises, boy, this is, this is King Saul who's asking the questions. Those are the only answers that I've seen among scholars all we need to say is that the bottom line is that in both the Old and New Testament, we are consistently forbidden by the Lord to try and consult the realm of the departed via spiritists and mediums. This is an illustration of Saul's last act of disobedience. So there's maybe a lot more that you want to ask about that, but I don't think it's the main point of these final chapters. I want to suggest here is the most important question that these chapters give us and, and, and a question that is relevant to every one of us. And I, I've listed a number of things here. Why does the Lord seem to help one person and not another? Why do some Christians mess up and that is the end of them. They never again go on with Jesus. They, they opt out of church. God doesn't seem to be real to them. It's just finito benito. While there, there are other Christians who mess up in exactly the same way, and yet it seems like a minor or mega blip on the graph of their life, but they get over it and they move on again with God. That, in my opinion, and I know I haven't proved it yet, is the question that these final chapters are forcing us to look at. Now, I debated whether I should say this or not, because it is quite negative, and I don't want to feed negatives to you. But what we're going to look at in the next few minutes is really quite complex. And I know that you're tired having been away and all the rest of it. And, and so um, I'm going to do the best job I can explaining what actually is quite a complicated question. So what we're going to do first of all is understand the question. Because the question that I've just asked, without any doubt, is the question that the Bible puts straight in front of us when we read these final chapters. Um, now, I just wanted to talk about the Bible and its inspiration and all the rest of it. And the first thing I wanted to suggest that you may or may not have thought about is that the Bible is very, 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 very carefully written. Yes, the Bible is inspired by God, breathed out by the Lord, Yes, the scriptures are authoritative for our lives. Yes, the scriptures are infallible. They, they are absolutely on the money in what they affirm about belief and about uh, Christian living, etc. And so nothing I'm saying when I say the Bible is very carefully written is not denying any of what I've just said. But I wonder if you realise that the Bible, parts of the Bible, were not scrawled on the back of a matchbox on a rainy afternoon. Whoever was writing was bringing skill and expertise to the very way in which they wrote. Now the problem is, if you read the Bible in English or in your own language, you can often miss that. 
because it doesn't come over in the translation. So let me, let me give you a, an example from the Psalms. That when we read the Psalms, there are all kinds of things about the way in which the Psalms were written that we don't realise when we read them in English or in our, in our uh, mother language. Let me give you an illustration. So, for instance, there are a number of Psalms that are called acrostic Psalms. And what that means is that each separate verse of the Psalm begins with the next letter of the alphabet. Now, that, that doesn't translate into English. Let me give you, let's, let's pretend I'm writing a psalm, all right? And I'm writing it in English. If I was writing it the way many of the psalms are written, I'd write it like this. Verse 1, and the Lord said. Verse 2, because you've done this, verse 3, cursed is the ground for your sake. Verse 4, despite your cries, I will not hear you. That's an acrostic psalm. First verse begins with first letter of the alphabet and so on, right the way through the Hebrew alphabet. Now, many of the Psalms are written like that, but when you read them in your own language and not Hebrew, you don't realise that. Somebody took a lot of trouble, a lot of effort to write the actual way they wrote it. Not just the message that God is inspiring them to write, but the manner in which it is written. Now, there are even more fascinating things in the Psalms and sometimes in the parables of Jesus. There are Psalms that I want to call a uphill and down the other side kind of a Psalm. The technical expression for that is a chiasmic Psalm. So, let's imagine you have a mountain and in that mountain you have the, I'm talking about an actual physical mountain, you have the base rock and then the next level is limestone, and then sandstone, and then granite, and then you have the trees, and then you have the top of the mountain. If you walked up that mountain and you were observing, you would see, hey, the strata is changing, and I can see it changing. It's base rock, it's limestone, it's sandstone, it's granite. Oh, here are the trees. Now I'm on the top of the mountain. Now you walk back down the mountain, you meet exactly the same strata or details in the opposite direction. Now, I would be willing to bet that many Christians do not realise that many of the Psalms are written exactly like that. And they're written like that for a purpose. They're written like that so you know what the top of the Psalm is. You know what the purpose of the Psalm is. Because when you start repeating stuff you've already heard, you realise, oh, I've just gone over the top and now I'm going down the other side. Now, somebody once said, that a picture is worth a thousand words. So let me give you an illustration of that, okay? Uh, from Psalm 23. So now putting some verses on that illustration, if you had an 11 verse psalm, and it was, an acro it was a chiasmic psalm, you would find that verse one said the same as verse 11 the first and the last verses. You'd see that verse 2 said the same as verse 10, and so on. Now, until somebody points that out to you, you don't even realise it. And you think, well, what's the point of it anyway? Because the psalmist is telling you, I spent a huge amount of time crafting this in Hebrew poetry, and the point that God wants you to get, that he laid on my heart and inspired me to write this way, is in this instance, verse 6. So let's, use an, let's uh, think about Psalm 23, okay? Here's the first level, the base level in Psalm 23. Here's what verse 1 says. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. Here's what the last verse says. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is poetry, so he's not repeating the, the words, but he's repeating the idea. You may or may not know that the only place in Psalm 23 where the words, the Lord, are used is in verse 1 and verse 6. And in each of those verses, he's making a statement about the Lord. The Lord's my shepherd. 
Therefore, I have all I need. Last verse. Surely goodness and mercy will track me all the days of my life and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now let's move up a level to the second verse and the penultimate verse. This is talking about God's provision for David. Verse 2. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. Now that's imagery. It's the imagery of, of a sheep lying down, but it's talking about food. Green grass. Quiet water. Something to eat and something to drink. Now read the penultimate verse. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. What's that about? It's about food and it's about drink. Okay. Next level, verse 3. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. It's talking about guidance. What does the balancing verse on the other side say? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. It's the same thing. It's about guidance and protection. Now, often, because we know nothing about chiasmic psalm structure, most of us, we just go blithely through the text and don't even see how important this is. What is the peak of Psalm 23? using that thing. It is this, you are with me. That's the peak. In, in, when you look at the Hebrew structure of that psalm, that is the summit, that is the centre. That's what everything is leading to or flowing from. David is saying the central truth in my life is that God is with me. Therefore, he protects me. Therefore, he guides me. Therefore, he provides for me. Therefore, all the days of my life and even after I die, God will be with me. So, I simply use that to illustrate that the very way in which Scripture is written is very important. Now, that is especially true when we come to the portion of Scripture that I just summarised for you. The, the chapters that, that I summarised early on are very well-crafted and very carefully written to bring something in front of you, all right? Which is Saul in contrast to David. All right, so let's look at this a, a, a bit more carefully. First of all, I wonder if you've noticed that the focal point, let's imagine that that the person who wrote 1 Samuel is making a film. And the, the, the focal point keeps switching between Saul and David. Now, I haven't flagged that up while we've been reading, but I promise you it's true. So let me just say really quickly, and you'll have to go away and look at this and study this, and, and then you'll see. So the first part of chapter 22 is David moving around keeping out of Saul's way. Then we switch to Saul. And, and there's a big focus on Saul, who's with all of his, his entourage around him. And he's trying to find somebody who will kill the priests of Nob. And then we switch back to David, who's safe at the cave of Adullam. And we talked about him saving the citizens of Keilah. Do you remember? Who is my neighbour? And then it switches to Saul chasing David. And then it switches to, to Saul coming into the cave where David is. And it's very positive about David. But then it switches to David with Nabal and Abigail. And it's very negative about David. And then it switches back to David on the battlefield. And it's positive about David. And then it's David going over to the Philistines. And then it switches to Saul and the medium at uh, Endor. And then to David and his escape from the Philistines. And then it finishes with Saul's death. The focus keeps changing. Let me just look at, look at the passages that, that we are going to reference now. That this passage especially has a changing focus. It's, it's almost like 
you know, we, we interrupt this program to bring you an important news flash. It's telling you one story and suddenly it flies off to something else and then it comes back to the program again. So 1 Samuel chapter 27, David goes over to the Philistines. 1 Samuel chapter 28, David is ordered by Achish, the political leader, to invade Israel. And then the attention switches. And it switches in a very important way that I'm going to mention in a few minutes. The attention switches to Saul and the medium of Endor. And then it switches back to David as God gets him out of invading Israel. The Joint Chiefs of Staff. We don't want this guy with us. And, and, and then it follows David as he goes back to Ziklag and he's going to find the people who, in, who destroyed Ziklag. And then it switches back to the Philistine battle against Saul and Saul dying atop Mount Gilboa. All right, now this next bit is the most complicated bit that we're going to look at. All right? And this will cause you to read your Bible in a very different way. So, not only is there a changing focus, but there is a changing flow. In other words, these final passages are not written in chronological order. Please stick with this. I know it's not goosebumps. But this is showing us how carefully the scriptures have been written because God is trying to say, red alert, red alert, see this, it's important. Ask the question, notice how I'm focusing you on something. So, I'm just going to give you, and you will not have time to write this down at all. But there are a lot of places mentioned in the chapters. All these uh, Philistine places and then things in the land of Israel. And because, to be really honest, most of us don't bother looking at a Bible atlas when we're reading stuff like this, we completely miss what is going on. All right, so, really fast. Gath is the city where, obviously, the king of Gath, who was sponsoring David, lived. Shunem, which is where the Philistine forces come to fight against Israel, is way up to the northeast. I'll give you the miles in a minute. Gilboa, which is the mountain where Saul dies and Je the Jezreel Springs, is just to the southeast of Shunem, about eight miles. The Witch of Endor is just to the north of Shunem, four miles. Aphek, which is where the, all the Philistine forces gather from all over the land of the Philistines. People are coming from different cities and different neighbourhoods and they're gathering at Aphek. And then you have Ziklag, which is about 50 miles south of Aphek. And then notice that the difference between Aphek and, and Ziklag is about the same as the difference between Aphek and where, where the fight was held. All right? Now I want to just show you something which probably, with the greatest respect, you haven't noticed. I just want to go through the events as they actually happened in real time. Okay? So the first thing is David is conscripted at Gath, called up with all the other people who lived around there, and then he marches to Aphek. Aphek is on the border between the land of the Philistines and the land of Israel. The next thing that happens in chronological order is that David is sent back from Aphek. The Joint Chiefs of Staff didn't want him, get rid of him. The next thing that happens is that David returns to Ziklag while the Philistines now start to march into Israel. The next thing that happens is that David chases the Amalekite raiders and, and, and locates them and destroys them. What is happening at this time is that the Philistines arrive at Shunem and begin to get ready for a fight, and Saul freaks out and consults the witch. What happens then is that Saul is killed, and that news of Saul's death comes to David. Here is the big idea. This is really, really, really important. Why I've put that thing in a circle, that thing is reported 
right after David is conscripted at Gath. That, that Saul sees the Philistine forces are all around Mount Gilboa, so he goes and consults the witch of Endor. Okay, and then the attention flashes back to David, who's now with the forces just starting to invade Israel. He's 45 miles away from where, where Saul is, and he's sent back again. That is really important. Now, there's only two ways of understanding that. I know they didn't write on pages, all right? I know they had papyrus and all the rest of it. But just pretend for a minute they wrote on pages. The only way of understanding that is that some guy dropped all the pages and put them back in the wrong order. Okay? Because the flow is not chronological in the, in the discussion. I, I have a friend, I've probably said this to you before, my friend uh, films, I've told you about him, and he says this, every film has a beginning, a middle, and an end, but not necessarily in that order. A lot of movies, you know, the movie starts, and then sometimes they say, six months earlier. Sometimes they don't say that. Because they're trying to create tension, they're trying to tell you a story, they're trying to get your um, focus on something. How many of you have seen the movie Eternal Sunshine of a Spotless Mind? Okay, just about four or five backsliders, that's okay. It's a great movie, I'm joking. Obviously a great joke. It features Jim Carrey and it features Kate Winslet. And it's interesting because each is playing the kind of role that the other one normally pr plays. So Kate Winslet is the kind of wacky, surreal character that Jim Carrey normally plays, and Jim Carrey is the touchy-feely, sensitive kind of person that Kate Winslet usually plays. And the movie is totally <coughs> incomprehensible. You don't know what the heck is going on. The, the only kind of thing that's helping you is that Kate Winslet sometimes has red hair and she sometimes has blue hair. That's the only thing that helps you. Because what they've done is they've woven these two stories together and you're never quite sure which story you're in. Are we in this story or that story? And the only marker is the colour of her hair. If you watch that movie, I strongly suggest that you watch it another two or three times and then you'll maybe start to figure out what the heck it's on about. Well, that is the, the deal that uh, the writer of 1 Samuel uses here. I promise you. And this technique is found in other parts of the Bible. Do you want an illustration? How many times did Jesus cleanse the temple in Jerusalem? Once or twice? When you read the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark and Luke, the cleansing of the temple is right at the end of Jesus' earthly ministry. It is cleansing the temple that gets him killed from a human point of view. When you read John's Gospel, the cleansing of the temple is right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And it's raising Lazarus from the dead that from a human point of view gets Jesus killed. So some people say, well, there must have been two cleansings of the temple, which is possible, but highly unlikely. It's much more likely that John is using this technique and saying, if you want to understand turning water into wine, which is the miracle he's just told you, and the implications of that, you have to put that right alongside Jesus cleansing the temple in Jerusalem. The two are telling you the same message, if you know how to read them. All right, so, the passage that we're looking at has a change of focus. It also has a change of flow. It also has a change of flavour. In other words, uh, let, me, let me just read... Saul, as he is walking away from his encounter with the medium, we read these words, Then she, the medium of Endor, set the food before Saul and his men and they ate. That same night they got up and left. The last thing we see about Saul is this disappointed, disillusioned man walking into the darkness. What do we see about David? 1 Samuel 29, verse 11. So David and his men got up early in the morning and walked back to the land of the Philistines. They are walking into the rising sun and Saul is walking into the pitch black of night. 
That's why we're asking this question. Why does God appear to deal so differently with Saul and David? Why does God help some and not others? Why do some mess up and that's the end of them? Why do other people mess up and it only seems a minor blip on the graph of their life? So now let's unpack this question. And you've heard me say this many times before, but let me say it one more time. This has to do with service, not with salvation. When we're looking at what happens to Saul and what happens to David, I am not talking about their eternal salvation. I'm talking about their usefulness to God as a king in Israel. So just three things as we close. First of all, this highlights for us the mystery of God. I don't know if you've thought about this, but on one level, David and Saul are not that different when you compare their lives. So first of all, early on, both of them have fairly mundane jobs. David is looking after sheep. Saul is going looking for some missing donkeys. Then the Holy Spirit comes powerfully on each one of them. And the same language is used for Saul and for David. Both of them are unfairly criticised by other people early on. Both of them rescue key cities and both of them fight against evil. So, why does God deal so differently with them? That's the question. So when we look at the positive stuff about them, very, very similar story. Now, let's have a look at the generosity of God's grace to them, to both of them. Both of these guys have their dark side. It is very easy to think that Saul is the bad guy and David is the good guy, and it isn't that simple. So, Saul totally loses the plot. We know that, we've seen that, we've tracked him. He's paranoid. He slaughters an entire village. He's forever throwing javelins at David or at his son, Jonathan. But David also has lost the plot on many occasions. You know, he goes over to the Philistines on at least two occasions. David is going on missions, wiping out entire communities, isn't he? When he's pretending to be working with the Philistines, he's obliterating entire communities. It's not going to be too long before David when he becomes king, is looking at someone else's wife and having sexual relationships with her and getting her pregnant and then getting her husband killed. David also has got his dark side. I mean, by the end of 1 Samuel, he's got numerous wives, for instance. So, you know, what is it? why does God deal with Saul one way and David another way? Now, neither David or Saul deserves God's love. Somebody once said this, the line dividing good and evil does not go down the middle of the human race. And so often we talk as though it does. You know, born-again Christians are good, Muslims are bad. People in my political party are great, People on the other side are bad. Our denomination is great. Their denomination sucks. Utter, complete rubbish. The line dividing good and evil does not go down the middle of the human race. The line dividing good and evil flows down the middle of the human heart. Somebody once said this. There is so much good about the worst of us and there is so much bad about the best of us that we better be very careful when some of us judge the rest of us. So this putting David and Saul alongside each other, first of all, is, is showing us the mystery of how God deals with people. There are questions we can't answer. It's secondly showing us the generosity of God's grace. But finally, and I think most important for us, it's showing us 
how important is the trajectory of our heart? Hello? What's going on inside of you and me, day in, day out, month in, month out, is the deciding factor as to when we screw up, whether that's the end of us, or whether it's just a little blip and we get up and brush ourselves off and move on again. Saul has a heart of independence and disobedience. Now, there are two classic illustrations of that that Andy Jack would have looked at. There's 1 Samuel chapter 13, when Saul, who isn't a priest, sacrifices animals before the Lord because he's not prepared to wait for Samuel to arrive, you remember? And then there's also the event in 1 Samuel chapter 15, where Saul refuses to kill the Amalekites, refuses to do what God has told him to do. So these are the classic illustrations of his disobedience, but these are not isolated events. They are the set of his soul. For year after year after year after year after year, he is resisting God saying to him, you're finished as king, David is my king. He fights against that. When, when prophets bring messages to him, it's la, 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 la. You know, when Samuel is personally warning him, he doesn't listen. And it's somewhat ironic that the day before his death, he calls up Samuel via a medium to ask him, uh, is there any message from the Lord? And Samuel says, yeah, it hasn't changed in the last 15, 20 years. You're finished. It's the set of his soul. If we compare that with David, it is completely different. David screws up. He's not right with God all the time. Any more than Rob Whitaker is or any more than you are. But one of the beautiful things about David is that when God speaks to him, however God speaks to him, you know, whether it's via Urim and Thummim or whether it's via Samuel or whether it's via Jonathan, we're going to look in our final lecture at many of the ways that God spoke to David. Whether it's through Abigail. David has a sensitive heart to the voice of God. And when God speaks to him, David is very, very quick to confess and to turn around and walk in the right way again. So here's my final question. Am I like a spacecraft controlled by NASA? They don't just point a spacecraft in the general direction of the moon and let it go. It would, it would miss by hundreds of miles. There are many, 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 many minor and major course corrections. Is that, is that my Christian life? I'm open to God and when he puts his finger on something, with his help I'll do something about it. Or am I like a rogue satellite going off on my own way? When I'm corrected, do I sulk or argue or ignore? Or with God's help, do I commit to change? Now, I said that was one of the most technical lectures we were going to have. And as I said, it's not goosebumps and, oh, you know, and all the rest of it. But it is a critical, critical question. Because I pray, God, this is not true. But if I contacted some of you, probably via a medium, that's a joke. If I contact, contacted some of you in 50 years, I wonder if I would find you sold out to Jesus and walking with him. Or I'd find you parked up going absolutely nowhere with the Lord. Because our observation is that not everybody who comes to Bible school in 10 or 15 or 30 or 40 years is sold out to Jesus. What makes the difference? That you never screw up? No, Saul and David both made mistakes. The difference is what you do when you make a mistake whether you repent and come back to the Lord or you just continue on your own sweet way. 
All right, we're going to have a five-minute break because our last lecture, which I think is one of the most important ones, it's really hard to get it in 40 minutes. We just do it in about 48 minutes, okay? So let's have a five-minute break, and then we'll go again. Hey, God bless you. Thank you.